Prentice Hall, in conjunction with Blossom Medical Communications, has produced this video tutor to complement the fundamentals of anatomy and physiology textbook by Frederick Martini, although you'll find it very useful no matter what text you're studying. The concepts you'll learn in the next 75 minutes will also apply to other related courses like anatomy, physiology, and introductory biology. Sometimes visualizing physiological processes can be difficult. The text provides a solid foundation, but couple that with a detailed 3D animation and you're off to a good start. Video footage is implemented to build analogies to further explain each concept. At the beginning of each segment is a list of concepts you should understand before viewing the segment. Also, each segment gives an overview of the major topics to be presented. In order to pace yourself, quizzes called concept checks are added after each section. If you are unable to answer the questions, it may mean that you should rewind this section and view it again. We hope that you'll find the video tutor as an invaluable study tool. Welcome to Prentice Hall's Video Tutor section on Protein Synthesis. By now, you know that the nucleus is an information storage center and that DNA holds that information. In order to understand protein synthesis, you might think of the nucleus as the headquarters of a manufacturing complex. The information needed to produce all of the protein products of the cells is located in the nucleus, stored in the form of DNA. Outside the nucleus, in the cytoplasm, are the raw materials, the amino acids, as well as the metabolic machinery that actually builds the proteins by stringing amino acids together. DNA must remain inside the nucleus. The two questions raised then are, how is the information in DNA transferred to the cytoplasm? And how is that information then used as a blueprint for polypeptide synthesis? To begin to answer some of these questions, we will look at the molecules and processes involved in protein synthesis. First, we'll describe the information storage system of a cell, the cell's DNA. Then we'll look at transcription, the process by which the information is copied to RNA so that it can travel to the cytoplasm. Finally, we'll describe translation, where the information in RNA is used to assemble amino acids into polypeptides and proteins. Each person's hereditary information is encoded by the DNA inside their cells. Half of the DNA was inherited from the mother and half was inherited from the father. The DNA is stored in cell nuclei. From its position in the nucleus, DNA controls cellular anatomy and physiology. This in turn determines the structure and function of the body and influences individual development and behavior. Thus, by controlling protein synthesis, DNA determines how an organism is built and how it functions. A DNA molecule consists of paired DNA strands that twist around one another to form a ladder-like structure called a double helix. Each strand is composed of a long chain of nucleotides, each of which contains a nitrogen base. Bases from one strand form hydrogen bonds with the bases in the opposite strand, forming the steps of the DNA ladder. The two DNA strands are complementary. One DNA strand, the coding strand, contains the information that specifies amino acid sequence in a polypeptide. The other DNA strand, called the template strand, is used to make the blueprint from which the polypeptide eventually will be made. There are four different types of nitrogenous bases in DNA. Guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. In RNA, 
thymine is replaced by a base called uracil. Because guanine can only pair with cytosine and vice versa, these two bases are said to be complementary. Likewise, thymine and adenine are complementary base pairs. DNA's information is stored in the linear sequence of its nucleotide. The fact that each nucleotide can pair with only one other type of nucleotide is important. Complementary base pairing forms the basis by which a DNA strand can be used to create an RNA molecule that retains the information of that linear sequence. Let's take a moment now for a concept check. How does DNA store information? What feature of DNA enables its information to be copied? Which DNA strand specifies the amino acid sequence in a polypeptide? Welcome back. Now that we understand how information is stored in DNA, let's explore how this information is used to make proteins. All the nucleated cells in the body, except for sperm and eggs, have exactly the same DNA. But some cells make hair, while others make eye color. This is because the different cells are using different genes to guide protein synthesis. A gene is a segment of DNA that contains all the information required to make a polypeptide. Each gene contains a specific sequence of nucleotides that determines the order in which amino acids will be linked together to form the polypeptide. As you recall, polypeptides are manufactured in the cytoplasm. Transferring the information in a gene to the site of protein synthesis requires RNA. There are three types of RNA in the cell. In order to understand the way in which these three types of RNA interact, let's return to our analogy of the cell as a manufacturing plant. To produce your product, you must create a blueprint, gather the raw materials needed, and have the machinery needed to assemble the parts. Each type of RNA does one of these three separate jobs. Messenger RNA, or mRNA, is the blueprint for polypeptide synthesis. Along the mRNA strand, each group of three consecutive nucleotides, called a codon, specifies a single amino acid. The sequence of codons along the length of the mRNA strand determines the order of amino acids in the new protein. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, brings in the raw materials for protein synthesis by binding to specific amino acids in the cytoplasm and carrying them to the ribosome for the assembly of amino acids into protein. Ribosomes, the protein factories of the cell, are made of one light and one heavy subunit. Each subunit is made of proteins and ribosomal RNA, or rRNA. The events leading to protein synthesis can be divided into two stages, transcription and translation. In transcription, the template strand of DNA is used to make a complementary strand of messenger RNA, which then carries the gene's instructions to the cytoplasm. During translation, Ribosomes use the information in the messenger RNA to assemble proteins. Although we will focus here on mRNA when we discuss transcription, you should remember that any RNA, whether it is messenger RNA, transfer RNA, or ribosomal RNA, must be synthesized through transcription of a DNA template. Now let's see how all these nucleic acids interact during transcription and translation. In order to transcribe DNA, the two strands of the double helix must first be separated to expose the template strand. Once this occurs, nucleotides already present in the nucleus begin to pair with the exposed bases with the help of an essential enzyme called RNA polymerase. This binding occurs only between complementary bases. Guanine in the DNA template will pair with cytosine in the growing RNA strand. 
thymine will pair with adenine and so on. Remember, however, that RNA incorporates uracil rather than thymine, so for every adamine in the DNA template, a uracil will be added to the RNA. RNA polymerase continues to link nucleotides until the mRNA is complete, after which the mRNA separates from the DNA template and moves out of the nucleus. Once in the cytoplasm, mRNA carries its information to a ribosome. Keep in mind that the ribosomal subunits exist separately in the cytoplasm. Before assembly of a polypeptide can begin, the ribosomal subunits must combine around an mRNA strand. This is a good spot for a concept check. Take a few moments now to answer four concept check questions. What are the two major processes of protein synthesis? What are the three types of RNA? Which type of RNA carries the blueprint for protein synthesis? What is the function of tRNA? Welcome back. Now that we have learned about transcription, the first major process in protein synthesis, let's move on to see how translation enables our cells to make proteins. Every day our bodies carry out varied tasks such as digesting food, growing fingernails, and making skin cells. These tasks and numerous others require proteins. As you know, the polypeptides that make up a protein are made in the process of translation. Translation occurs on ribosomes and requires the coordinated efforts of messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA, and transfer RNA, as well as numerous proteins. The first step in translation, initiation, begins when an mRNA binds to a free light ribosomal subunit. A transfer RNA molecule then brings the first amino acid to the light subunit of the ribosome. Other protein factors join this assemblage, and then the heavy ribosomal subunit combines to complete initiation. Transfer RNAs continue to bring in amino acids in the order specified by the sequence of nucleotide bases in the mRNA. For each possible triplet combination, there is a specific tRNA that will bind to it. Amino acids floating in the cytoplasm are picked up by tRNA molecules and delivered to the ribosomes. An amino acid attaches to one end of the transfer RNA molecule, while on the other end are three exposed bases. Because these bases attach in complementary fashion to the three bases in an mRNA codon, this region of the tRNA molecule is called the anticodon. Only a tRNA with a specific anticodon can pick up a specific amino acid. Many types of tRNA molecules exist, and each has a different anticodon to carry one of the 20 different amino acids needed for protein construction. Thus, the sequence of codons in the mRNA strand by binding only complementary tRNA intercodons determines the sequence of amino acids in the newly synthesized polypeptide. In the initiation step, as the first tRNA approaches the ribosome, its anticodon binds to the mRNA codon at the first of two binding sites on the light ribosomal subunit. Elongation is the second step in translation. After initiation, a second tRNA attaches to the second mRNA codon which occupies the other binding site on the light subunit. An enzyme associated with the heavy ribosomal subunit catalyzes the removal of the amino acid from the original tRNA and attaches it to the amino acid on the newly arrived tRNA. In this process, a peptide bond forms between amino acids, creating a dipeptide. 
the original tRNA detaches from the mRNA and leaves the ribosome, which shifts or translocates three bases to the right along the mRNA strand. This brings a new codon to the binding site on the light ribosomal subunit. When a tRNA with the appropriate anticodon binds to this codon, it will deliver the next amino acid to be added to the growing peptide chain. This cycle repeats until polypeptide formation is complete. In the last step of translation, called termination, a stop codon signals termination factors to help cut the polypeptide off the last tRNA and release it from the ribosome. Once made, a polypeptide chain, singly or in combination with other polypeptide chains, assembles in the cytoplasm into a new protein. Let's pause here for a final concept check. By what process is a polypeptide made in the cytoplasm of a cell? What specifies the sequence of amino acids in a growing polypeptide? What is the final step in translation? What is translocation? I hope this Prentice Hall video tutor section has helped you understand the components of protein synthesis. Welcome to the Prentice Hall Video Tutors segment on Membrane Structure and Function. In this section, we explore how the cell's membrane controls what goes in or out of the cell. Cells are the structural and functional units of living organisms, whether tall and thin or wide and flat, whether transporting oxygen or absorbing nutrients. Cells share common structures. One of these is the cell membrane. To begin to understand how cell membranes function, we will first examine some basics of membrane structure. We will then discuss diffusion and osmosis and how these processes move substances across membranes. Finally, we'll take a closer look at carrier proteins, the proteins that exchange molecules across the cell membrane. Like the walls of a house or building separate the interior from the outside world, the cell membrane is a barrier that separates the contents of the cell from the external environment. Cell membranes are a mosaic of protein and lipid molecules, both of which can drift from place to place within the membrane. Most of the surface area of the membrane consists of a type of lipid called phospholipid. Each phospholipid molecule has a polar head and a nonpolar tail. The phosphate-containing head is hydrophilic, or water-loving, because its polar structure is attracted to water molecules, which are also polar. The fatty acid tail is hydrophobic, because it is nonpolar and repels water molecules. Cell membranes are phospholipid bilayers, a double-layered structure in which the hydrophilic heads of the phospholipids face outward. The middle of the membrane contains the hydrophobic tails of the phospholipids, an arrangement that shields them from contact with water molecules. Whereas membrane lipids act as a general barrier around the cell, membrane proteins have specific functions. For example, they may act as enzymes, receptors, anchors, or channels. There are two major populations of membrane proteins. Integral proteins, which are part of the membrane structure and usually span the width of both phospholipid layers, and peripheral proteins, which are bound to the surfaces of the membrane. Understanding the basic parts of the cell membrane is important. Before we move on, let's take a moment to answer four concept check questions. <laughs> 
What separates the interior of a cell from the external environment? What are the major components of a cell membrane? Phospholipid molecules have a polar and nonpolar end. How does this affect how they interact with water? What are some functions of membrane proteins? Now that we know what cell membranes are made of, let's look at how they work. Like bumper cars, molecules are in constant motion, colliding, then bouncing off each other. When bumper cars collide, they scatter into less crowded areas. They spread out from an area where they are highly concentrated to an area where they are less concentrated. Diffusion is the process by which particles in a substance move from an area of relatively high concentration to an area of relatively low concentration. Although molecules move freely in a solution, they may not be able to pass through the cell membrane, which is permeable to some molecules but not others. This semi-permeability of a membrane is important to its function. But before we go further, let's continue our discussion of diffusion by defining some key terms. Solutes are particles that are dissolved in fluid. If the particles are not distributed evenly throughout the solution, the difference in the solute concentration between two areas in the solution is called the concentration gradient. The random movement of particles by diffusion in a solution always causes them to move from an area of higher concentration to one of lower concentration, or down their concentration gradient. As this movement continues, the particles eventually become distributed evenly. In other words, Diffusion takes place until the concentration gradient is eliminated. At this point, where there is no net movement of particles in any direction, equilibrium has been reached. Random molecular motion still continues, but the overall distribution of solute remains even and constant. Dropping an ink drop into a container of water demonstrates diffusion. Ink molecules are highly concentrated in a drop, but not elsewhere in the container. The ink molecules in the container behave like bumper cars, randomly colliding with each other and with water molecules. The ink molecules diffuse from the drop where concentration was highest to areas of lower concentration. The ink molecules diffuse until equilibrium is reached and the ink is distributed evenly throughout the container. Here is a schematic look at diffusion of an ink drop. There is net movement of ink molecules from an area of high concentration to one of low concentration. One important point to remember is that diffusion is a transport bargain for cells, since diffusion occurs without any energy input by the cell. An essential feature of cell membranes is that they are selectively permeable, meaning some materials pass through them freely, while other materials cannot. Passage may be restricted by a molecule's size, shape, and or electrical charge. For example, fat-soluble molecules such as steroids, alcohols, and some vitamins can dissolve in the lipid portion of the membrane, which is how they diffuse into and out of the cell. Water-soluble molecules, however, cannot pass through the hydrophobic middle portion of the phospholipid bilayer. Instead, they must diffuse through the membrane channels. Even then, only ions or very small molecules can fit through such channels. The channels formed by membrane proteins are like doorways through which molecules enter and leave cells. Membrane channels, like doorways, come in several types. Some doorways have no doors, so they are always open. Membrane channels that are always open are called leak channels. Some doors open and close. Channels that open and close are called gated channels. Other doors allow movement in and out at the same time, exchanging someone going in for someone going out. Membrane proteins that do this are called carrier proteins. Only solutes of a particular type can pass through a given channel, 
As with all diffusion, when molecules flow down their concentration gradients freely across the membrane, the cell does not have to expend energy. Take a moment now to answer a few concept check questions. What is meant by selectively permeable? What are some determinants of whether a molecule can cross a phospholipid bilayer? How much cellular energy is required for a cell to gain or lose substances through diffusion? What macromolecules of a membrane form channels? Welcome back. Now that we've looked at diffusion of solutes, let's take the time to look at diffusion of water across a membrane, a process called osmosis. Like other molecules, water molecules move from an area of high concentration to an area of lower concentration. Osmosis occurs when water diffuses across a membrane that is freely permeable to water, but not to solutes. In this container, two solutions are separated by a membrane permeable only to water. The concentration of the large yellow solute molecules is higher in solution B than it is in solution A, because there are fewer solute molecules in solution A. The inverse is true of the water. The concentration of water molecules, represented by small blue spheres, is higher in A than in B. The way in which water will behave in this example is similar to how osmosis occurs in cells. The solute molecules are too large to pass through the pores of the membrane. However, water molecules freely move across the membrane. Water molecules move down their concentration gradient, moving across the membrane from the side with the higher water concentration to the side with the lower water concentration. This increases the volume of B. Water movement continues until the solute concentration on both sides of the membrane is equal. For our discussion, we are ignoring the counteracting effect of the weight of the column of water. Osmosis across the cell membrane depends on the tonicity of the cell's environment. Tonicity is the term used to describe what effect a given solution will have on the tension of a cell membrane placed in that solution. Tonicity depends on the difference between the solute concentration on the inside of the cell versus the outside. Fluid that normally surrounds cells is isotonic. Iso means equal, and when the concentration of solutes is equal on both sides of the cell membrane, no net movement of water occurs into or out of the cell. Hypo means below, and a hypotonic solution is one that has a lower solute concentration than the cell. Consequently, a solution that is hypotonic will force water across the cell membrane into the cell. The cell swells and eventually may burst or lyse. Hyper means above, and a hypertonic solution is one that has a higher solute concentration than the cell. Consequently, an extracellular solution that is hypertonic will force water to move out of the cell, causing the cell to shrivel or crenate. Are you ready for another concept check? Take a moment to answer the following three questions. What is osmosis? What is an isotonic solution? What is a hypertonic solution? Welcome back. Let's now take a look at how some other molecules cross the cell membrane. Most molecules needed by our cells are not lipid soluble and they are too large to pass through membrane channels. Instead, carrier proteins pick up molecules on one side of the membrane and release them on the other side. Each carrier protein transports only specific molecules or ions across the membrane. In facilitated diffusion, movement is down the concentration gradient and requires no energy expenditure by the cell. Most sugars, as well as all amino acids and nucleotides, are moved into cells by facilitated diffusion.
Despite the assistance of the carrier protein, this movement occurs through diffusion down a concentration gradient and is considered passive transport, since no energy is expended by the cell. Movement against a concentration gradient, however, costs the cell energy in the form of ATP. This process is called active transport. A carrier protein, such as the sodium-potassium exchange pump, uses energy to move ions across the cell membrane against their concentration gradient. In this example, ATP's energy is harnessed to move sodium ion out of the cell and potassium ions into the cytoplasm. This is the pump that maintains the differences in sodium and potassium ion concentrations between intra- and extracellular fluid. What does a carrier protein do? What is facilitated diffusion? Does facilitated diffusion require ATP? What is active transport? This concludes our section on the cell membrane. Next time you look at a doorway, think of the proteins that continuously transport molecules and ions into and out of your cells. Welcome to the Prentice Hall Video Tutor section on protein-to-protein -protein interaction in muscle contraction. The activity of skeletal muscle tissue allows us to move our bodies. Without functioning muscle tissue, we would be unable to sit, stand, walk, speak, or participate in other usual daily activities. How do muscles move our joints? What happens in muscle tissue when our nerves signal it to contract? To begin to answer questions like these, we will look at skeletal muscle in four ways. We will describe the anatomical organization of skeletal muscle tissue. Then we'll examine the structure of a sarcomere, the repeating functional unit in myofibrils. Next, we will look at the link between action potential and muscle contraction called excitation contraction coupling. Finally, we will explain what happens during a contraction cycle. Skeletal muscles are surrounded by a layer of collagen fibers, the epimesium, which separates the muscle from neighboring bones and other tissues. Fascicles of the muscle are surrounded by another membrane, the paramecium, through which pass blood vessels which transport nutrients and waste products to and from the muscle and nerves that provide the signal for contraction. Each fascicle contains numerous long, multinucleated muscle cells called fibers, and each muscle fiber contains numerous long cylindrical structures called myofibrils. Adjacent skeletal muscle fibers within the fascicles are bound together by delicate endomesium. An individual muscle fiber is surrounded by a specialized cell membrane called the sarcolemma. Invaginations of the sarcolemma form transverse or T-tubules that penetrate into the cell and encircle every myofibril. Also surrounding the myofibrils are the membranes of the sarcoplasmic reticulum, shown here in blue. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is an internal membrane network similar to the endoplasmic reticulum of other cells. Near the T-tubules, the sarcoplasmic reticulum expands into blind end chambers called terminal cisternae. The association of a T-tubule with two terminal cisternae is called a triad. Before going ahead, let's take a moment to review what we've just learned about the organization of muscle tissue.
What is a fascicle? What is the epimysium? What is the sarcolemma? Terminal cisterni are part of what structure? Welcome back. We'll now take a close look at the structure of the sarcomere. Remember that each muscle fiber contains hundreds of cylindrical structures called myofibrils. The ends of each myofibril are attached to the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber. Thus, when myofibrils contract, muscle fibers shorten. A myofibril consists of a linear chain of sarcomeres. Sarcomeres are the smallest functional unit of a muscle fiber. They are composed of precisely organized proteins referred to as thick filaments and thin filaments. When these filaments slide past each other, the sarcomere contracts. Z lines mark the boundaries between adjacent sarcomeres. Within a sarcomere, thick filaments are found in the A band. Thin filaments extend through the I band and into the adjacent zones of thick and thin filament overlap. The thick and thin filaments must slide past one another in order to make the sarcomere contract. Let's look more closely now at these filaments to see how the sliding is accomplished. Thick filaments are made of the protein myosin. Thin filaments contain the proteins actin, tropomyosin, and troponin. G-actin, here shown as red spheres, is globular actin. Each G-actin molecule has an active site that combines to the myosin of the thick filament. G-actin is strung together to make a twisted strand called F-actin. Tropomyosin molecules are positioned so that each covers seven active sites along an F-actin strand. The position of tropomyosin in a resting muscle fiber prevents interactions between proteins of the thick and thin filaments. Midway along the length of each tropomyosin molecule is a molecule of troponin. Troponin has three globular subunits. One subunit attaches the troponin to tropomyosin. A second subunit binds to G-actin and holds the troponin-tropomyosin complex in position on the actin filament. The third subunit binds calcium ions. When the intracellular calcium level is low, the calcium binding site is empty. Tropomyosin molecules cover the myosin binding site on actin and the muscle is at rest. When the intracellular calcium level rises, the calcium ions bind to troponin, causing a change in the position of the troponin-tropomyosin complex so that the active sites along the F-actin strand are exposed. Thick filaments are made of bundles of myosin molecules. Each myosin molecule has a double-stranded tail and two globular heads. In a thick filament, the myosin molecules line up so that the tails point toward the center of the sarcomere and the heads project outward toward the thin filament. The heads are arranged in spirals along the length of the thick filament. The myosin heads use energy from ATP hydrolysis to cock themselves into position to bind with actin. Knowing these structures of the thick and thin filaments will be important as we see how sarcomeres contract. Take a moment now for a quick concept check. What proteins are found in a thin filament? The thick filament is made of what protein? Which molecule in the thin filament covers the sites that bind myosin? The binding of what ion causes a change in the positions of thin filament proteins? Welcome back. Now we're going to look at the steps that lead from an action potential in the nerve to a muscle contraction. You might think of an action potential as the trigger for muscle fiber contraction. 
But how does this trigger work in muscle tissue? A motor neuron and the muscle fibers it activates are called a motor unit. In a motor unit, the neuron communicates with muscle fibers at neuromuscular junctions. When an action potential reaches the synaptic terminal at a neuromuscular junction, a chemical signal is released. The chemical diffuses to the sarcolemma of the muscle fiber and changes the permeability of the sarcolemma to sodium ions. The rush of sodium ions across the sarcolemma triggers the formation of an action potential that sweeps across the sarcolemmal surface. The action potential travels along the membrane of the transverse tubules. Its passage triggers the release of calcium ions from the terminal cisternae. The released calcium ions are bound by troponin. When this occurs, the troponin-tropomyosin complex changes shape. Now the newly exposed active sites of the thin filament can interact with the myosin heads that project outward from the thick filaments. The myosin heads bind to the exposed active sites, forming cross bridges that link the thick and thin filaments. We'll look more closely at how the cross bridges form and cause the filaments to slide. But first, let's have another concept check. What is a motor unit? What is the name of the junction between a muscle cell and a neuron? Which sarcomere protein binds calcium ions? What organelle releases the calcium? Welcome back. Let's see what happens now that the myosin heads have bound to the actin filaments. The cross bridges that form between thick and thin filaments must go through cycles of attachment and detachment so that the filaments smoothly slide past one another. Once binding occurs, the myosin head pivots, pulling the thin filament toward the center of the sarcomere. After pivoting, the myosin head binds a new ATP molecule breaking the link between the thin and thick filaments. The ATP is hydrolyzed and the myosin head is cocked back into position to form new cross bridges with actin and begin another contraction cycle. The cross bridge formation is similar to the work your hands would do in pulling up an anchor. Cross bridge formation can continue for as long as calcium ions and ATP are present. The repeated pivoting cycles slide the thin filaments toward the center of the sarcomere, shortening the sarcomere and contracting the muscle. Remember, all the sarcomeres shorten together so the ends in each myofibril move closer together. You might compare this to what you see when an accordion is compressed. The outfolds correspond to Z-lines of adjacent sarcomeres, just like the outfolds in this compressed accordion. The Z lines move closer together during the contraction. After the contraction, there follows some passive expansion that returns the muscle fiber toward its resting state. What molecule provides the energy for muscle contraction? Do sarcomeres lengthen or shorten during contraction? During contraction, how does the amount of overlap between thick and thin filaments change? As we have now seen, all of our activities that use skeletal muscles depend upon the amazing organization and function of the sarcomere.
Welcome to the Neurophysiology section of the Prentice Hall Video Tutor Series. If you've ever been on a crowded committee where many people are trying to make their ideas heard at once, it may seem remarkable that any one person hears or makes sense of what anyone else is trying to communicate, let alone collate all that information and make a decision. If you think that's impressive, imagine a situation in the brain where a single neuron may communicate continuously with thousands of other neurons. How is information transferred from one neuron to another in the brain? To begin to answer this question, this video tutor segment will cover several aspects of neurophysiology. First, we'll start with a look at the structure of a neuron. Then, we'll define transmembrane potential and examine how neurons maintain theirs. Next, we'll look at how the movement of ions across the cell membrane affects the transmembrane potential. Finally, we'll examine an action potential. We'll see how it is propagated along the membrane of a single neuron and how a stimulus is transmitted to another neuron across the synapse. Neurons are the specialized cells that control and monitor body activities and physiological functions. They sense changing conditions process sensory input, and direct the body's responses. Neurons come in many different shapes and sizes, but for all of them, the cell body, also called the soma, contains the nucleus and most of the other organelles. Extending from the soma are branch projections called dendrites. Their job is to receive information from the extracellular environment from other neurons or from other specialized cells. A typical neuron also has a long process called an axon that carries information that will be relayed to another neuron or a different cell type. The axon ends in fine extensions called telodendria, each of which has an expanded synaptic terminal at its tip. A synaptic knob shown here is one type of synaptic terminal. Inside each synaptic knob are synaptic vesicles containing chemical neurotransmitters that, when released from the synaptic knob, affect the transmembrane potential of another cell. How well do you know the structure of neurons? Take a few moments now to assess your understanding by answering four concept check questions. What is another name for the cell body of a neuron? What cytoplasmic projection carries information toward another cell? Which cytoplasmic projections of a neuron receive information from other neurons? And what structure are neurotransmitter molecules stored in the synaptic knob? Let's move on now for a look at transmembrane potentials. Intracellular and extracellular fluids have different ion compositions. Extracellular fluid has relatively high concentrations of sodium ions, which are positively charged, and chlorine ions, which are negatively charged. In contrast, an intracellular fluid, the most abundant positively charged ion is potassium and most of the negative charges are carried by proteins. The negatively charged proteins cannot pass through the cell membrane, so we can think of these negative charges as trapped inside the cell. Both sodium and potassium ions, however, can pass through leak channels in response to the passive force of gradients. There are two gradients that exist across the membrane a chemical gradient that causes the ions to diffuse to areas of lower concentration, and an electrical gradient, which causes ions of like charge to move away from each other, and ions of opposite charge to move towards each other. Let's first look at how these forces affect the movement of potassium. Potassium ions respond to both electrical and chemical forces. Although the electrical force opposes movement out of the cell to some extent, 
The chemical force is strong enough that potassium ions move down their concentration gradient and diffuse out of the cell through leak channels in the membrane. When these positive charges leave the cell, the interior of the cell membrane is left with an excess of negative charges. The charges carried by the intracellular proteins Thus, the inside of the cell membrane is negatively charged compared with the outside. Sodium ions slowly leak into the cell. They follow both chemical and electrical gradients and enter the cell. The difference in positive and negative ion distribution across the cell membrane creates a polarization that can be measured as a transmembrane potential. The transmembrane potential of a resting cell is about negative 70 millivolts. Any shift in the transmembrane potential away from resting levels towards zero millivolts or above is called depolarization. At the normal resting membrane potential, three sodium ions diffuse into the cytoplasm for every two potassium ions that diffuse out of the cell. The sodium-potassium exchange pump counteracts these movements. For each molecule of ATP expended by the cell, this exchange pump ejects three sodium ions and reclaims two potassium ions. In this way, the sodium-potassium exchange pump maintains the transmembrane potential and stabilizes the ion composition of the intracellular fluid. Let's stop here for a quick concept check. At rest, is the interior of a neuron negatively or positively charged relative to the exterior? What is depolarization? What two forces contribute to ion movement across the membrane? What ion is brought into the cell by the sodium-potassium exchange pump? Let's now take a look at how depolarization leads to an action potential. If the trigger of a gun is pulled just a small amount, the gun will not fire. For the gun to fire, the trigger must be pulled past a certain point. Similarly, the cell membrane of a neuron can depolarize a little without anything happening. However, once the neuron depolarizes past a level known as the threshold, an action potential is generated. Action potentials are depolarizations that start at the initial segment of an axon and are propagated toward the synaptic terminals. They are called all or none events because either an action potential is triggered or it is not. There is no in-between state. Prior to an action potential, the neuron is at rest with a membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. Now, if a stimulus depolarizes the cell to threshold, which is about negative 60 to negative 55 millivolts, voltage-regulated sodium channels in the membrane open. The sodium ions that rush across the cell membrane change the transmembrane potential rapidly from threshold towards zero millivolts, where positive and negative charges are in balance. It then continues toward a positive potential, where positive charges outnumber negative charges on the inside of the cell membrane. When the transmembrane potential reaches positive 30 millivolts, the sodium channels close. The voltage-regulated potassium channels, now fully open, then allow potassium ions to flow out of the cell, a movement driven by both chemical and electrical gradients. As these positively charged potassium ions leave the cell, the transmembrane potential returns toward resting levels. The potassium channels begin to close when the resting potential is reached and finish closing shortly thereafter. During the absolute refractory period, the membrane cannot generate an additional action potential no matter how strong the stimulus is. This occurs while the voltage-regulated sodium channels are open 
and when they are closed and inactivated. The absolute refractory period typically extends until a transmembrane potential repolarizes to near threshold levels. During the relative refractory period, which occurs while the voltage-regulated potassium channels are open, another action potential can be generated, but only by larger than normal stimuli. Let's take a moment here for another concept check. What is meant by all or none event? What happens to sodium channels when the transmembrane potential reaches positive 30 millivolts? What is absolute refractory period? Now that we've seen how an action potential is generated across the neuron membrane, Let's see how that action potential is transferred along the axon and eventually to other cells. An action potential can travel in one of two ways, either as a series of many small steps or in a series of a few leaps. When an action potential in an axon spreads to a neighboring region of its membrane by a series of small steps, the process is called continuous propagation. When it propagates by jumping from one site to another along the axon, the process is called saltatory propagation. Saltatory propagation occurs along axons that have myelin sheaths. In the peripheral nervous system, these myelin sheaths are formed by Schwann cells. The myelin acts as an electrical insulator allowing ions to move across the cell membrane only at the gaps or nodes between adjacent Schwann cells. Therefore, action potentials rapidly travel from node to node. Once the action potential has traveled down the axon, its message must be passed on to the next cell. A neuron relays information to another neuron at a synapse. The neuron transmitting the information is called the presynaptic neuron, and the neuron receiving the information is the postsynaptic neuron. Let's look at what happens at a cholinergic synapse, one of the most common types of synapses. When an action potential arrives at the synaptic knob of the presynaptic neuron, voltage-regulated calcium gates open. Calcium ions enter and bind to synaptic vesicles. This leads to exocytosis, which releases the neurotransmitter acetylcholine from the synaptic vesicles into the synaptic cleft. Acetylcholine molecules then diffuse across the synaptic cleft and bind to ACH receptors in the membrane of the postsynaptic neuron. The binding opens ion channels and the membrane depolarizes. If this depolarization brings the initial segment of the postsynaptic neuron to threshold, it will result in an action potential. The depolarization of the postsynaptic membrane is short-lived because acetylcholinesterase rapidly breaks down the ACH in the synaptic cleft. What does threshold potential mean? What is a synapse? What type of ion channels in the initial segment open when threshold is reached? What happens during repolarization? Now the next time you communicate with your friends, Think of how all the neurons in your brain communicate with each other.
Welcome to the Prentice Hall Video Tutor section on vision. Our sensory receptors tell us about the world around us. The most complex sensory receptor, our eyes, detect light and give us detailed images of our surroundings. Have you ever wondered how our eyes detect light? And how can we see both near and far? What are the functions of the colored part of the eye? In this video tutor, we will begin to answer these questions. First, we will look at the accessory structures of the eye. Then we will examine the path that light travels through the eye. And finally, we'll examine the retina and the special cells that detect light, the photoreceptors. Our eyes are protected, lubricated, and supported by accessory structures. The most obvious of these are the eyelids. By closing, eyelids protect the surface of the eye, keeping it both lubricated and free of debris. Also, the eyelids have glands that secrete oily substances, which further protect the eye. Another accessory structure is the conjunctiva. This delicate mucous membrane lines both the inside of the eyelids and the anterior surface of the eye. The conjunctiva are kept moist and clean by tears produced by the lacrimal gland. The lacrimal gland is located in the eye socket, or orbit, just superior and lateral to the eye. Also located outside the eye, but not considered accessory structures, are the six extrinsic muscles of the eye. Together, these muscles control the position of the eye in its orbit. Before we go on, let's take a moment for a concept check. What structures physically protect the anterior surface of the eye? What controls the position of the eye? What is the conjunctiva? What structure produces tears? Welcome back. We'll now take a look at the structure of the eye itself and follow the path of a light ray as it enters the eye. Much as light travels through the lens of a camera and is focused onto film, light traveling through your eye is focused onto the retina. Also like a camera, your eye adjusts the amount of light that enters it. The opening through which light enters the eye is called the pupil, and the structure that controls the diameter of this opening, thereby adjusting the amount of light that enters, is the iris. The outermost layer of the eyeball is called the fibrous tunic. This tunic is made of dense avascular connective tissue that is divided into two parts, the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is the white part of the eye. It provides mechanical support, helping the eye keep its shape. It also provides a place of attachment for the extrinsic eye muscles. Anteriorly, the sclera is continuous with the cornea. As light enters the transparent cornea, the cornea bends the light rays. This is the first step in the focusing process, which projects a coherent image onto the retina. Light passing through the cornea enters the anterior chamber of the eye. This chamber is filled with aqueous humor, a clear fluid that is similar in composition to cerebral spinal fluid. At the posterior boundary of the anterior chamber lies the iris. The iris is the part of the eye that determines eye color, and its two smooth muscles are what control the diameter of the pupil. Light passes through the pupil to enter the posterior chamber, another chamber filled with aqueous humor. The iris attaches to the ciliary body, a thick ring containing smooth muscle tissue of the ciliary muscles. As we will see in a few moments, the ciliary muscles control the focusing power of the lens. The other function of the ciliary body is the production of aqueous humor. The iris and ciliary body are two parts of the middle layer of the eye called the vascular tunic, or the uvea. The third part of the uvea also includes the choroid, a highly vascular and deeply pigmented layer of the eye.
The capillary networks in the choroid provide nutrients to all three layers of the eye. Light leaves the posterior chamber by passing through the lens, a transparent structure that ultimately functions to focus light on the retina. The lens is made of precisely organized layers of cells. It is covered by an elastic fibrous capsule. Suspensory ligaments connect the lens at its periphery to the ciliary body. To focus light from a distant object, the ciliary muscles relax. This increases tension on the suspensory ligaments and flattens the lens. To accommodate for a near object, the ciliary muscles contract, thereby decreasing tension in the suspensory ligaments and allowing the lens to spring back into a more rounded shape. After light passes through the lens, it enters the largest chamber of the eye, the posterior cavity, or vitreous cavity. It is filled with a transparent, jelly-like vitreous humor, which has two functions, to help maintain the shape of the eye and to keep the retina in contact with the choroid. Before we examine the retina more closely, take a moment to assess your understanding of the concepts just discussed. Where is the posterior chamber and what fluid does it contain? What is the function of the vitreous humor? What are the functions of the ciliary body? What is the function of the iris? Now we're going to take a closer look at the retina. Light traveling through the vitreous humor is focused onto the retina, the innermost layer of the eye. The retina has an inner neural layer, which contains photoreceptor cells and an outer pigment layer, which absorbs the light that has passed through the neural layer. The neural layer of the retina contains two types of photoreceptors, rods, which detect dim light, and cones, which require bright light and provide color vision. Rods and cones are distributed unevenly throughout the retina, with rods predominating in the periphery of the retina. In the posterior portion of the retina, where the light is most focused, there is a region called the macula lutea, which contains only cones. In the center of the macula lutea is a depressed spot called the fovea, where the concentration of the cones is the highest. When you look directly at an object, its image falls on the fovea of your retina. When photopigment molecules inside a rod or cone absorb light, the shape of the pigment molecule changes. This shape change triggers a series of events that alter the activity in other layers of the neuroretina. Ganglion cells, which monitor the activities of photoreceptors, send the newly gathered information to the brain. The axons of these cells form the optic nerve of each eye. Because no photoreceptors lie in the region where the optic nerve leaves the retina, light striking this area goes undetected. This region, the optic disc, is also known as the blind spot. Let's pause now for a concept check. What are the two types of photoreceptors? Which photoreceptor allows us to see in a dimly lit room? In what region of the retina are photoreceptors for color vision, cones, most highly concentrated? What happens to a photopigment molecule that absorbs light? I hope this video tutor section on vision has helped you understand the structures of the eye.
Welcome to the Prentice Hall Video Tutor section on hearing and balance. In the temporal bones of our skulls, receptors detect sound waves with a variety of pitch and loudness. Also housed in our temporal bones are the receptor complexes that help us maintain our equilibrium. They monitor gravity, acceleration, and rotation. How do ears detect different sounds? How does the body know when it has lost its balance? How do we stay balanced in the first place? To begin to answer some of these questions, we will look at an overview of hearing and balance. First, we will examine the anatomy of the ear. Then we'll take a closer look at the receptor complexes of the inner ear. Then we'll describe the physiology of hearing and explain how our ears detect changes in equilibrium. The human ear is divided into three compartments, the external ear, middle ear, and inner ear. The external ear is the auricle, or pinna, a cartilage-supported fleshy flap that helps to funnel sound waves into the external auditory canal. Sound waves travel down this canal to the tympanic membrane, a thin sheet of connective tissue also known as the eardrum. When sound waves strike the tympanic membrane, it vibrates. The mechanical energy of the sound waves is converted into the mechanical energy of eardrum vibration. On the other side of the tympanic membrane lies the middle ear, or tympanic cavity. This is an air-filled mucosa-lined cavity which lies within the petrous portion of the temporal bone. The middle ear is flanked laterally by the eardrum and medially by a bony wall with two membrane-covered openings, the oval window and the round window. Running from the middle ear to the nasal pharynx is the eustachian or pharyngotympanic tube. The tube allows air pressure in the middle ear to equalize with air pressure in the atmosphere. Medial to the middle ear is the inner ear, which contains the spiral-shaped cochlea, where sound waves are transduced into neural signals, and the vestibular complex, which contains the receptors for our sense of equilibrium. These sensory organs of the inner ear lie within the so-called membranous labyrinth, which is visible here as a blue tube within the cochlea. Surrounding and protecting the membranous labyrinth is the bony labyrinth. Note that within the cochlea, the membranous labyrinth is known as the cochlear duct, and the bony labyrinth is known as the bony cochlea. Between the bony and membranous labyrinths flows the paralymph. Within the membranous labyrinth is fluid called endolymph. What is the purpose of the eustachian or pharyngotympanic tube? In what structure are sound waves transduced into neural signals responsible for hearing? What is another name for the membranous labyrinth portion of the cochlea? What is the name of the fluid within the membranous labyrinth? Welcome back. Let's see now what happens when sound waves arrive at the eardrum or tympanic membrane causing it to vibrate. When the tympanic membrane vibrates, the chain of three tiny middle ear bones moves, the malleus, incus, and stapes, or hammer, anvil, and stirrup together are called the auditory ossicles. The arrangement of these bones forms a lever system that amplifies the energy of the sound waves before it reaches the cochlea. Notice that the stapes fits into the membrane-covered oval window at the base of the cochlea, here shown in orange. Within the bony cochlea is the cochlear duct, here in blue. Alongside the cochlear duct are the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct. When the stapes pushes against the oval window, pressure waves in the paralymph travel up the spiral through the vestibular duct and back down in the tympanic duct. Pressure is relieved when the wave reaches the round window. Now let's look at a cross-section of cochlear duct and see what happens to the specialized receptor cells in it as they are struck by the pressure waves in the paralymph. The blue endolymph-filled cochlear duct now appears as the central triangular section, 
The vestibular duct and tympanic ducts, both containing paralymph, are on either side of it. Sitting on the basilar membrane of the cochlear duct are hair cells of the organ of corti. Above the hair cells is the tectorial membrane. When the vascular membrane is moved by pressure waves in the paralymph, hair cells are pressed against the tectorial membrane and their stereocilia are distorted. The distortion generates a signal that travels through the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve to the brain, where the signal is ultimately interpreted as a sound. Stop and assess your understanding of the concepts just presented by answering the following three concept check questions. What is the name of the cochlear structure in which receptor hair cells for hearing are located? Where are the auditory ossicles? Which membrane is distorted by pressure waves in the vestibular duct? Welcome back. Let's move on to take a look at the other sensory organs in the inner ear. In addition to the cochlea, the inner ear houses two other organs that help us detect and maintain our position in space. We'll now look at these. The central egg-shaped cavity is the vestibule, which contains a pair of membranous sacs, the saccule and the utricle. Inside the utricle and saccule are hair cells similar to those in the organ of corti. The hair cells are clustered in the macula, where their processes are embedded in a gelatinous mass and lie under a thin layer of crystals called otoliths. When the head tilts, gravity moves the crystal mass and distorts the stereocilia of the hair cells. This is how the saccule and utricle provide information about position with respect to gravity. Behind the vestibule is the third portion of the bony labyrinth, the semicircular canals, here shown in purple. The canals project from the posterior region of the vestibule in three spatial planes. Each canal contains a membranous semicircular duct here shown in pink, where angular momentum is sensed. At the base of each duct is an expansion called the ampulla. Within the ampulla, long stereocilia of hair cells are embedded in the cupula, which sticks out into the endolymph. When your head moves, the endolymph moves the cupula and stimulates the stereocilia. Let's pause here so you can use the next four concept check questions to assess your understanding of how the inner ear helps us maintain our equilibrium. In which sacs in the vestibule of the labyrinth is gravity detected? What fluid is in the semicircular ducts? What is the role of otoliths? Where are the hair cells of the semicircular canals located? I hope that this Prentice Hall video tutor section on hearing and balance has helped you to understand how the sensory organs of the ear accomplish their complex jobs. Welcome to Prentice Hall's video tutor section on the heart. Usually, you are unaware of the constant pumping of your heart. During vigorous exercise, however, you can feel your heart pounding in your chest. And you might wonder, how does the heart work? How does the heart work?
How does it move blood through the body? What makes it speed up or slow down? To begin to answer some of these questions, we will consider the heart in four ways. First, we'll examine the external and internal anatomy of the heart. Next, we'll describe the structure and function of heart valves and how they maintain the unidirectional flow of blood. We'll then look at the conduction system of the heart. And finally, we'll explain the events of the cardiac cycle. The heart is a muscular pump that works continuously to circulate blood through the cardiovascular system. Blood carries oxygen, nutrients, hormones, waste, and other substances to and from cells of the body. The heart pumps our five liters of blood through the body nearly 1,400 times per day, every day of our lives. The human heart is divided into four chambers, two upper chambers, called the atria, and two lower chambers, the ventricles. Near the base of the heart, blood vessels connect to each chamber. Blood enters the heart through the large veins, which empty into the thin-walled atria. Blood leaves the ventricles in large arteries, which carry blood away from the heart. You can think of the heart as two separate pumps operating side by side within one organ. A thin interatrial septum separates the two atria, and a thick interventricular septum separates the two ventricles. On the right side, blood enters the right atrium, then travels to the right ventricle. The right ventricle then pumps the blood through the pulmonary circuit and back into the left side of the heart. On the left side, blood enters the left atrium, then travels to the left ventricle. The left ventricle then pumps the blood through the systemic circuit and back into the right side of the heart. When the heart beats, it propels blood simultaneously through these two circuits. In this design, blood flow is unidirectional, that is, it flows in one direction only, first through one circuit, then through the next, and back again to the first. Before going ahead, Take a moment now to assess your understanding of heart anatomy by answering the following four concept check questions. What is the function of the heart? What is the name of the upper chambers of the heart? What vessels are attached to these chambers? What vessels carry blood away from the heart? Welcome back. Let's move on to our next topic, heart valves. Some heart functions can be assessed from the outside of the body. For example, the loudest heart sounds heard during a physical examination are the sounds of heart valves closing. There are four valves of the heart one in each chamber. Located at the point where blood leaves the chamber, each is a membranous flap that serves to prevent backflow of blood. Valves are thus essential in keeping blood flow unidirectional through the heart. Atrioventricular or AV valves are located between the atria and the ventricles and prevent backward flow of blood from the ventricles into the atria. Semilunar valves are located at the point where blood leaves the ventricles, preventing backflow of blood into these chambers. On the right side of the heart, a semilunar valve separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk. And on the left side, a semilunar valve separates the left ventricle and the aorta. Now let's examine the path of the blood as it moves through the heart during a single cardiac cycle. We'll discuss the cardiac cycle in more detail later in this segment. For now, just remember that the cardiac cycle is a sequence of heart movements that occur in the course of a single heartbeat. When the heart beats, oxygen-poor blood enters the right atrium through the superior and inferior vena cava and the coronary sinus.
Blood flows from the right atrium into the right ventricle through the open right AV valve or tricuspid valve. As the right ventricle fills, 70% flow is passive through the relaxed right atrium. When the right atrium contracts, it completes ventricular filling by pushing in the last 30%. Now, when the right ventricle contracts, the tricuspid valve is pushed closed and it prevents backflow of blood into the right atrium. As contraction continues, pressure on blood inside the ventricle rises until the pulmonary semilunar valve is forced open. Blood is propelled into the pulmonary trunk and toward the gas exchange surfaces of the lungs where oxygen is picked up and carbon dioxide is discharged. The pumping of the right ventricle also forces oxygen-rich blood in the capillaries of the pulmonary circuit toward the left side of the heart within the pulmonary veins. These veins empty into the left atrium. From the left atrium, blood flows into the left ventricle through the open left AV valve, the bicuspid valve. As on the right side of the heart, 70% of the blood flow into the left ventricle occurs while the left atrium is relaxed. Atrial contraction provides the remaining 30%. Then, as the left ventricle contracts, the bicuspid valve swings shut, preventing backflow into the left atrium. As the contraction continues, ventricular pressure rises until the aortic semilunar valve is forced open and blood rushes into the systemic circuit. After traveling to tissue capillaries, blood will return to the right atrium and begin the cycle anew. Because more work is required to push blood through the systemic circuit than through the pulmonary circuit, the muscular wall or myocardium of the left ventricle is thicker than that of the right. This is a good spot for a concept check. Take a few moments to quiz yourself. What are the two circuits for blood flow from the heart? What are valves?